Thank you for singing. You may be seated. Pastor, please come and bring us the word this morning. <clears throat> please open your scripture to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John this morning. We'll find ourselves in chapter 5. For our text this morning, uh, we'll begin reading the story that is accounted in verses 1 through 11. By the way, uh, it's good to have each of you here today. I did mention, uh, but my parents are here as well. If you've ever wondered how I got to be so handsome, uh, you just meet my parents in the back row. Uh, you ever get to wonder where I got my clever wit and uh, wonderful sense of humor? Uh, meet my parents in the back row. You ever wonder why I'm such a jerk? <laughs> well, anyway, third point. John 5. John 5. Before we do any review, let's just read our text and ask the Lord's help this morning for our focus and before we pray for that. All right, so verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now pay attention to the next two verses because this is really where we'll segue into our message. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Let's read verse 12. Then asked they him, What man is it that said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? All right, now we'll pray. Father, as we look at the healing of this man, help us not, God, to just see with human eyes that which is impossible for man, but help us to have seeing eyes to not only see what is possible for God, but to get a picture into the heart of Jesus, to know who our God is. We pray in His name. Amen. Well, there's a lot in this story. It's a great story, actually, isn't it? I think this would be a great nursery story, uh, you know, to tell in the nursery. And it would be great if the Sunday school teachers could come up with some really nice craft to go with the Bethesda. Something to countermand or counterreact all of the sheep with cotton balls glued on them that happens in the kids' churches. I'm tired of sheep with cotton balls on uh, Miss Angela, she likes to put cotton balls on sheep just because she knows that's like the craft that Sunday school teachers always do. But I'd love to see a, you know, a paralytic man or a man with an infirmity being healed at Bethesda, like maybe a, a painting or something. Maybe that ought to be what we would do a mural of in the nursery instead of a Noah's Ark or something like that. Now I'm just being silly about all of that. But the fact is, is that this is really a remarkable encounter. Remember the theme of the Gospel of John? Remember what we're, where we're at as we're studying John? Remember the difference between the other Gospels and the Gospel of John? Remember Matthew presents Jesus Christ as Jesus is the Gospel, and he presents Jesus as the King of the Jews and traces the genealogy of Jesus from King David all the way down until Jesus Christ. Because David is the rightful, lawful King of the Jews. Mark shows us the humanity of Jesus. And he really makes a lot out of the fact that Jesus uh, was the Son of Man. And emphasizes that a great deal. Deals, mentions that Jesus Christ comes from Adam. Luke, uh, again... 
Uh, Mark, Mark emphasizes the servant aspect and also the son of man, uses the from Adam, and Luke does the same thing. But Luke's genealogy traces Jesus all the way back to Adam and shows that Jesus Christ, the first Adam, sinned, and Jesus is the second Adam who never sinned and died for sin to redeem mankind. What's different about John? What? How to be saved. Yeah, the other Gospels say this is who Jesus is. John says this is how you receive Jesus. And so right away we're introduced very, very quickly to Jesus. We're introduced very quickly to the ministry of John the Baptist foretelling Jesus. And there's a, an important section of material there about John the Baptist. But now we're in a portion of the Gospel of John where we are seeing this is what Jesus did and how people came to Jesus. We saw first how Nicodemus met Jesus. And we saw the illustration of something that if you were to read, uh, if you were to read the Torah by itself, really makes no sense at all, does it? You ever just read uh, the account of the serpent in the wilderness and try to figure out how God and a snake... You know, what's the, what's the correlation there? And I just can't imagine really having that part of Israel's heritage and part of this is how God works and something that God did, but wondering about the symbolism of a serpent being lifted up in the middle of camp in the worship of Jesus Christ. The worship of God, I should say. But Jesus used it as an illustration. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so we know that that significant occurrence, where people are bitten by a poisonous serpent, is a symbol of the fact that we're bitten by sin, by the serpent. But that Jesus Christ is lifted up on the cross, God's sinless Son. And that to have eternal life, you have to believe in Jesus. And now we're in a string or a sequence where John gives us story after story after story about Jesus and his encounters with sinners and how they all came to Jesus. And we've had a pretty good sampling, haven't we, of the kind of people that Jesus saves. And I like the sampling. All the way up to chapter 8 where we're going to see the woman who's taken in adultery. And what we find is that every person that Jesus saves is relatable. Is relatable. Because Jesus saves every kind of person. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that an incredible truth? And that's another illustration of what we're going to see. But we're also going to get uh, from the writer's account a little bit of a perspective of Jesus, not only of the kind of people that He saves, but the kind of people God loves. And we're going to be looking at people before they're saved and after they're saved here in this instance. Okay, so you know the story, don't you, about the paralytic man? If you read it carefully, there are a couple of things that stand out. First of all, the man has had an infirmity for 38 years. Now, I'm not sure if this was just my impression or maybe I was taught this, but I've always thought the man was 38 years old and that he was born with the infirmity. But that isn't actually what the Scripture says. It says that he had the infirmity for 38 years. And you know, I'm not sure what would be worse. To be born never uh, having an ability or uh, to have an ability and lose it. I don't know. I think, it, again, the personality and the attitude of the person toward the infirmity would definitely uh, affect that. You ever uh, read uh, the story of Helen Keller? A uh, baby, really, when she was a baby, she got, what was it, the scarlet fever, but she became deaf and blind. And so she was always deaf and blind. And people are inspired by Helen Keller, even though I think she's probably lost. She probably never was born again. Uh, they're inspired by Helen Keller's attitude toward life. Because without ever, uh, with, have, having only heard sound early in her life, she learned to speak. And being blind, she learned sign language and learned to communicate. And uh, she became quite a philosopher and became a prolific author and so forth. And she was an overcomer, so she took her circumstance, or a uh, word I've coined, her circumstantiation, and she made something out of it. She, I'm joking about that word, okay? Don't, you know, you're like, Pastor, you're not very smart if you think that's a real word. It is a real word. I made it up. 
Okay, so enjoy it. And you can use it, but make sure that you give credit where credit's due for it. All right, now, the reality of it is that she inspires us because of how she responded. I don't know what it'd be like to be born blind, but I suppose if that's always the way it is, that's the way it always would be. Like the man that was blind from birth, he's just always blind. And you know what? He was created blind for the glory of God. It didn't seem like he was going around saying, hey, I need to be given my sight, but it certainly would be a good thing for him to have his sight. Now keep this in mind. Always remember this, Christian. The miracles that Jesus did with regard to healing still were under the sun. This is coming to our mind a lot because it, our teenagers, we've been studying Ecclesiastes in Sunday school, learning what life's all about. We've learned that anything that is on this earth is vanity because it doesn't have eternal value. And so if you value something that can only last as long as say it could last as long as this world by way of a legacy, it's all going to burn. So it's under the sun, and it's a vanity. Well, any person who's healed or raised from the dead, where are they at today, those people that Jesus healed and raised from the dead? Well, they still died, but the major, the major event, the main thing is that they had their sins forgiven them. We're going to see that in the story of this man today. You say, Pastor, it's a lot of introduction. I know, but I want us to think along this thought process of this man. This man had an infirmity for 38 years and it seems as though first of all it was besetting. He couldn't, he wasn't functional with his infirmity. He was, matter of fact, so dysfunctional that he couldn't get himself into the pool. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on you say, Pastor, you really believe that an angel troubled the waters? Well, that's what the gospel says. It says an angel troubled the waters and the first person to get in the waters was healed. Now, an angel didn't have supernatural power. Evidently, an angel being a messenger of God would trouble the waters and somebody could get healed. But the problem for this guy was for 38 years he'd been trying to be the first person in, but nobody would help him. Or somebody always got there first. And I can imagine, you know, this would be a popular spot. Uh, uh, if we're perhaps a person who is more influential or rich. I can't, I just, sometimes I just sit here and think, I wonder what, who, wonder what people got there first. You know, I wonder if a guy that, you know, maybe didn't have as big an infirmity got there first. It probably wasn't on a diplomatic basis. Well, who has the worst illness and needs healing the most? And let's treat it along this way. It was probably just a matter of who could supplant someone else and get there first. You know? And uh, so for 38 years, this man's had an infirmity. He's wanted to be healed. And Jesus just said to him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. You want to be healed? Yeah, I want to be healed, but I can't. I can't get in the water because no one will help me, and any time I'm close to making it, somebody beats me to it. And Jesus said, well, you know, just get up and take up your bed and walk then. Well, that's a good day, isn't it, for this man? 38 years with an infirmity. And he rises, takes up his bed, and walks. And the irony of it is that he doesn't even get the opportunity to talk to Jesus afterward. Now, I can imagine he was probably a little bit giddy. I don't know his personality type, but I can imagine, rise, take up, I can walk, boom, he's out of there. But it says also that Jesus basically slipped away out of the crowd, and he was gone. And when he went into the temple, the Jews said to him, how'd you get healed on the Sabbath day? And he said, well, you know, a man said, the man told me to take up my bed and walk, and I did. And instantly they're going, well, you know, you shouldn't be carrying a bed on the Sabbath day. The sort of thing, you know, that individuals that don't care that Jesus is God and that the Sabbath is made for man and not the Sabbath. That's their whole dialogue, but they want to know who it was that healed him. And the irony here is that this man was healed by a stranger. They just said, would you, would you like to be healed? Well, yeah, I would. I can't be healed. Well, then get up and walk. Okay, he gets up and walks, and Jesus disappears, and he goes his way. And I don't know about you, but I'd want to know who it was, wouldn't you, that healed me? And I think he did. It just, it all happened so fast. You know, sort of like a Barney Fife kind of thing, you know. It all happened so fast. You know, I just, I didn't have a chance to figure out what happened. I was overwhelmed by it. And so that's sort of the setting for this. And now I want to just, we're going to make one point today. I'll just go ahead and tell you what it is. Uh, we're going to look in Matthew chapter 5, and particularly at verse 45, where Jesus makes the statement to his disciples that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. 
But I want to start off first, well, don't turn there yet. We're not going there yet. I just want to tell you what the point is in case I never get around to it. Uh, and that way, you'll leave here having heard something worth something. Okay, so at this point, at this stage, as we've read in our account of Jesus healing the man at Bethesda, he hasn't been saved. He's met Jesus, but he doesn't know who Jesus is. And he's received healing physically, bodily, and yet he hasn't gotten forgiveness for his sins. And we know, particularly if we read Mark's account of the paralytic man that was lowered through the roof, that the greater thing is to have forgiveness of sins. I want to remind us about this today, my friend. You can have fantastic health. And you can acknowledge that your health is given to you by God, but if you never meet Jesus, you really don't have what you need. So here's a man who for 38 years has had an infirmity, no longer has his infirmity, but he still has a problem, and his problem is he doesn't know Jesus. Why did Jesus heal a man that didn't even stop to find out who he was? And the simple answer to it is because that's the sort of thing God does. That's the kind of God that God is. Don't, don't, don't miss this, Christian. Don't, don't gloss over it. Don't, don't move to, on to the next thing so quickly. God loves the wicked. God loves sinners. And He loves them while they're wicked. He loves them while they're sinners. Now, I know there are individuals who've developed a theological system that says that God hates the wicked. But the fact is that Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. And here's an individual who has an infirmity, but he's godless. So we look at him as a poor, unfortunate man, which is true compared with everyone else, but we forget that he's a sinner, and that sin is against God, and God hates sin. And so here's an individual that actually is God's enemy, and Jesus healed him. And what do we learn from that? Well, we learn a lot about how God thinks. Listen, you say, Pastor, well, God ought to love the wicked. You don't. You don't. Oh, yes, I do. You know, I love the wicked. I, I just, I don't, I don't like to be judgmental. I don't whatever. Listen, if I spend enough time chatting with you, I find some wicked person that you hate, and the reason you hate them is because they're wicked. I'd find something. If we talked long enough, I'd find something that triggers you and gets you upset. And it'd be about some injustice or some evil or something somebody does. Maybe they're cruel to animals. How many of y'all like people that are cruel to animals? Second worst, cruel to children. <laughs> really, in our society today, is the, the lesser of evil. Uh, but, you know, we could just get a consensus. How many of y'all think it's good to be cruel to animals? You'll tell me serial killers are cruel to animals. Or serial killers. How many of y'all love serial killers? See, we can talk about some things. We'll find something, won't we? We will find something that you hate. We'll find people that you hate. And what I want to tell you this morning from this example in the Scripture is that all sin is against God, and God hates sin, but God loved this sinner. Jesus even let the man walk away. Still a sinner. But healed him anyway. Friend, you need, to, you need to ponder this. You need to think on this. Because I fear sometimes our gospel witness is rendered ineffective because we don't love the lost like Jesus does. You hear me this morning? I believe that many times our gospel witness is hindered because we do not love the lost the way that Jesus does. And the way that Jesus loves the lost is that He just loves everybody. Amen. Just loves sinners. Now, when you're feeling as though, you know what, I am terrible, when you really understand your sin and the way you stand before a holy God in heaven, your natural conclusion, I'm talking about you with the things you've done. I'm not talking about some you know, terrible person. I'm talking about you and the terrible things you've done against God. I'm talking about me and the terrible things I've done against God. God ought to hate me because everything I've done has been in spite of the fact that He created me and I answer to Him and that every sin I've committed is against Him. Your sin is directed. It is an affront against holy God in heaven, and so is mine. And Jesus healed this sinner, and he walked away. 
Now let's go to Matthew chapter 5, if you're there. Verse 43. Matthew gives the account of Jesus explaining this truth. John gives us the account of Jesus living this truth. Do you see the difference again between the two Gospels? Let's look at this. Verse 43. Jesus said to His disciples, this is again is when He's teaching them about discipleship, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's reasonable enough, isn't it? Don't hate your neighbor. Hate your enemy. No, Jesus said, You've heard that, but I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now those aren't lovable individuals, are they? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Notice verse 45. For He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. You know, wicked people don't wake up without a sunrise. They wake up to a beautiful sunrise that God made. Same as you do. The same as I do. You know, the idea or the notion that God won't allow the wicked any recourse. He won't allow them to enjoy life or to live. He just makes their life miserable from the day of their birth until the day of their death. just isn't so. The Bible says God makes it to rain on the just. Just meaning righteous, as well as the unjust, that is the unrighteous. In other words, the, the good and the wicked. And God makes the same rain to fall on them. Now, is there a special blessing from God on His children? We could go all day talking about that. But does that mean that God only gives evil to those who aren't His children? No, God's good to the wicked. Do you hear me? See, you and I, we, we know that this is a fact, but try to wrap your mind around the fact that God is good to the wicked, understanding that the wicked, their sin is personal to God. What they've done to God is personal. Try loving someone who does terrible things to you. See, the, the lost do terrible things to God. You know, you and I ought to be so offended about it. The truth of the matter is, I'm less offended today by blasphemers being blasphemous. It just doesn't bother me that much because I realize they're not blaspheming me, they're blaspheming God. And God's got it handled, but when I read... Matthew chapter 5, and when I read this example of this paralytic man, I realize God's attitude toward them is that He loves them when they blaspheme Him. He loves them. You ever ponder Pentecost, Acts 2? The church has received fullness of power and they're preaching the gospel in great power and everybody's hearing them in their own languages. Who are the people who hear the gospel message of Peter that the gospel, the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off. Who are the people that the Bible says when they heard this, they were pricked to their hearts? What were they pricked to their hearts about? This same Jesus, whom ye crucified, him hath God raised from the dead. In other words, you killed Jesus. Now, shouldn't God hate people that kill Jesus? You say, Pastor, you know, I, I heard a song that I'm the one who killed Jesus. I'm talking about the people who were crying, crucify Him. See, I'll be quite honest with you, I don't want anybody to die. I, 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 I realize and I understand that in God's justice system there are causes for death, but I don't even want to participate in that. I just don't want to be there. I don't want to be part of it. I realize that there are people who are... Uh, they, they are God's judges in that case. They, God uses them to do those things. That's not me. I don't want to do it. I want to participate in that. And I, don't think, I don't think even had I not uh, been a follower of Jesus that I would have screamed crucify Him. That's a terrible thing. Think about how wicked it is to cry for the blood of one who's never sent. Think of the blasphemy of crying for the blood of one who's never sinned and saying, release to us a robber instead. Give us Barabbas instead of him. Think of the atrocity of that. Now when they heard this, they were pricked to the heart and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And what is Peter's word? There's nothing you can do. It's over for you. 
God hates you now. Humanly speaking, that's what we think, don't we? Wouldn't you like to get your hands on the people that put their hands on Jesus? That's us. I'm telling you, God's not like us, my friend. God is not like us. And when He tells His disciples, I'm giving you a new commandment. You've heard that it hath been said, love thine enemy and hate thy neighbor. But I'm telling you, love your enemy. Bless them that hate you. Bless those that... Did I say love your enemy, hate your neighbor? Thank you. All right. Yeah, whatever. But it's all wrong anyway. All right. Love the people that persecute you. Love the people that despitefully use you. Love everybody. And it's not just, ah, we love every... I'm talking about love everybody. Behave as though you love everybody. And you think, boy, that's easy to say and hard to do. And here in John chapter 5, we see Jesus doing what He says. There's a man that deserves his infirmity. And actually what he deserves is hell. Actually, because he sinned against God just like you and I have. He deserves everything. He doesn't deserve to have a good life. He deserves to have his infirmity, and more than that, he deserves hell. And Jesus heals him and lets him just walk away. You say, well, Jesus knew that he'd see him later. Listen, my friend, God knows everything. There's no debating that. But there's an example here for us, and it's very plain. It's plain as a nose on your face if you want to see it. And it's that Jesus is acting out, is living out the words and the commandments to his disciples, love your enemy. And so this man walks away, and let's read the account now. Are you back in John chapter 5? I'm not. Now I am. Verse 12, Then they said to him, What man is it that said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed, verse 13, wist not who it was. He didn't know. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Now notice verse 14. Afterward, the man found Jesus in the temple. Isn't even actually what happened, is it? Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Look! Behold, look! You're made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. That's a loaded statement, actually. You wonder what caused the man's infirmity based on this statement. I'm not going to say more than the Scripture says, but Jesus told him, sin no more lest the worst thing come unto thee or happen to you. So you better, you better shape up and act right or you, it's going to be worse for you than it was. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which made him whole. And that word whole is another loaded word because it means whole in every way. See, Jesus didn't just heal him of his infirmity. Jesus healed him of his problem, which is sin. He told him. Now, do you, do you say, Pastor, was this man saved because he stopped sinning? No, he's saved because he met Jesus. But when he met Jesus, notice it. Jesus came to him. And when he met Jesus, Jesus did not give him the condition of shape up and act right, and then I'll heal you. Jesus just healed him because it rains on the just as well as the unjust. That's God's attitude. And then after he let the opportunity of meeting Jesus and meeting God and taking care of his sin, after he met, had the opportunity and let it slip away, Jesus found him and made him whole. And afterward he knew who it was. It was Jesus. Friend, that's a really simple message, but it just isn't the way we think, is it? It's the way God thinks. And if you and I could get our thinking straight and think like God thinks, we'd walk out of here, and for the rest of our lives, we'd think God loves sinners, and so do I. God loves sinners, and so do I. You know, I fear that many times the reason... We are ineffective in preaching the Gospels because we have examples like Jesus and the way that He encountered individuals. And we think, well, you know, before God answers your prayer, I'm not even going to pray for you until you trust Jesus as your Savior. I've heard Christians say, well, you know, God doesn't answer the prayer of the lost. I'd like you to show me that in the Bible somewhere. I've met lost people that say, God's answered my prayer and I believe them. The lost people say, you know what, I had this thing 
And uh, I prayed, and God, God answered my prayer. And sometimes they think that they're saved because God answered their prayer. And they're no more saved than this man was because he was healed. You hear me here this morning? Just because God's been good to you does not mean that you're not His enemy. It just means that He loves you. But God wants you to be His child. And God's just good to everyone. God's just good. You know we have a saying, God's good all the time. All the time God's good. Friend, we could say God is good to the wicked all the time. And it's really true. Sometimes we think that we're better than God. Because the wicked are so bad, we, we just have to hate them. Because they're wicked. And my friend, God doesn't hate anybody. And neither should you and I. We ought to love the wicked. Have you ever met somebody and you just thought, I didn't want to share the gospel with them? I didn't want to talk to a person like that? Well, let me ask you a second question. Did Jesus ever meet someone like that? The answer is no. Not from His perspective. Every person Jesus met, He wanted to, he wanted to give eternal life to. That's God's attitude. God's never met a wicked person and said, you know what, I don't want to save him. I just, I, you know, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, it just always boggles my mind. Because I know it's talking about me, and what's amazing about it is that Jesus loves, ungodly, loves the ungodly. God loves the ungodly. God loves you. And God loves every person you've ever met, even if they're an enemy and they persecute you. That's why it's so much fun to read Acts chapter 9. Saul. Saul. Breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. I mean, just spewing out hatred for God. Just, I mean, his breath is cursing God and God's people. You say, Pastor, it was in his zeal that he did it. Yeah, but he was cursing God's Son. He can be zealous and wrong. There's no one wicked or more wicked than Paul. When he says he was a chief of sinners, friend, he was not exaggerating. Look at the evil that he did to Christ, the cause of Christ, and Christ's church. He terrorized believers. He was an absolute terrorist. And the Lord met him on the road and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And God reached out to him. You may be here this morning and by degrees you may be different, but it in comparison with God's perfect holy character, you're the same. That is, you're wicked. You're God's enemy. Everything you've done is against God. And God loves you. God loves you. You may not have met God yet. You may have even experienced like the paralytic man, the man with the infirmity. You may have experienced God's goodness. God wants to meet you. So much so that Jesus Christ, God's Son, came, lowered Himself, lower than the angels, to become a servant of men, and died on the cross in the place that you should die and face God's wrath. So that by simply calling on the name of the Lord, you can be saved. And that's the kind of God God is. The kind of God who'd send His Son to die for sinners. The kind of God who loves sinners and the kind of God who, Jesus said, reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And here we see an example of Jesus performing the things that He taught. What's your attitude toward God? It might be that you're here today and you have never settled the matter of your eternal salvation, never received Jesus. What kind of an attitude is that toward a God that loves you? you got to call on the name of the Lord. You're here and you're a believer, and you love God, you love good people, but you hate the wicked. God loves the wicked. What kind of an attitude is that? There's a lot for us to learn from the teaching of Jesus and the example that He lived. Father, I pray that You would help us to learn this example. God, I pray that You would just impress us so much with the kind of person, not only that Jesus is, 
but the kind of persons that Jesus loved. God, I ask You to move in our hearts, that You'd give us conviction, that You'd put faces right now in our minds of people that we do not love. And God, help us to see the cross, which is demonstration that You do love those people we do not. And God, we want to be Your disciples, and so we need to love the way that You love. So help us to love. Before we finish our prayer this morning, I'm going to ask each person just to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed so that you can have a private moment between you and God. My eyes are open right now, but I'll ask that you keep yours closed. I'd like to ask just two simple questions here today, and then we're going to have a time that we can respond to the questions that we ask. The first question, and I wouldn't call you out or embarrass you, but the first question is a matter of your eternal life. You're here this morning... And the question for you is, do you know that God is your Father? Do you know that more than just God's answered your prayers, more than that God has just been good to you, do you know that God is your Father and Jesus is your Savior? Has there been a time when you've received Jesus, God's Son? If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I could say, yes, I know that there's a time I've received Jesus. And I'm concerned about that. Don't call me out or embarrass me. But would you pray for me because that's a matter that I'm not sure about and it's a matter that I'm concerned about. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up real quickly. Slip your hand up so I can see. I'll pray for you. I won't call you out or embarrass you. Slip it right up. Secondly, you say, Pastor, you know, when I look at the words and teachings of Jesus and then I look at the way that Jesus lived out what He taught, I realize I don't love sinners the way that Jesus does. And the Holy Spirit of God has prompted me, has convicted me, that that's one of the reasons why I'm not as effective as I could be in reaching lost people for Jesus. is because I don't love sinners the way that Jesus does. But God showed me that, and I'm going to respond to what He showed me. Would you pray for me that God would finish the work that He's done on that matter in my heart? Yep, just slip your hands right up. I see that? Okay. All right, slip right back down. Well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask our pianist just to play. And this morning, we're not going to sing an invitation. But I'm going to ask our pianist just to play a couple of verses of the invitation. And we'll remain in our seats for just a couple of minutes. You tell God what you've told me, and then I'll pray for you, okay? Uh, Angela, would you pray? Uh, play page 246. God, please bless and move in our invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. person that's on your heart, on your mind, somebody that God showed you, you don't love this lost person, you don't love this person who's not lovely, but I do, ask God to help you, ask God to give you a heart of love toward them. <clears throat> God, the scripture is so plain so clear. And this morning, many in this room have signified that we don't love the way that Jesus does. But God, realizing who we are, we realize it's, it's not only right, but God, how could we not love someone that you do? And so God, I pray that you would help us in our hearts and our minds, not only to surrender these matters, but Lord, to learn to love as Jesus does. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Thanks for your great attention this morning. You're dismissed.